Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about aldol reactions using silyl and boron containing enolates. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems I assigned last lecture. In this first problem, we take this tert-butyl-methyl ketone and treat it with benzaldehyde in the presence of LDA. And because we're using LDA instead of something like sodium methoxide or sodium hydroxide, we're afforded with the beta-hydroxy ketone rather than the alpha-beta unsaturated ketone we would get under condensation conditions. In this next problem, we have this bicyclopentane containing ketone, and it's treated with this pentenal in the presence of some sort of conditions. And so I wanted you to suggest whether or not LDA or proline should be used to prepare the desired product. Now, if you recall, if we use LDA, we'll typically get the Z enolate so that we can uh, end up getting the syn alcohol product upon aldol reaction. Now, if you use proline, usually you're going to get the E enolate or E enamine rather. So you have to choose an appropriate method to get the desired product. So this is just to highlight if you want to get a syn product, even though this is a mixture of uh, enantiomers, because this and its mirror image will both be formed as this enolate and the electrophile are both achiral, um, you have to use a lithium enolate using the knowledge that we've talked about so far. Some of the chemistry we're going to talk about today with boron aldol reactions actually let you access the same products, but if you choose a chiral boron containing compound, you can get one enantiomer of your product. So let's get into today's material, aldol additions of silyl and boron enolates. If you recall from our earlier lecture, lecture 18, where we were talking about asymmetric alkylation reactions, if you uh, end up isolating a TMS enol ether, you can choose to access one product over the other. So as I showed here for this example, if you treated this with LDA, you'd get a mixture of products. And uh, the advantage to using a TMS uh, enolate is that you can get a single diastereomer of your product. And so this is a, a huge advantage as this could be much easier to separate than the mixture that we get in the other case. So this is similar looking to the original image that I'd put in lecture 18. The difference here is instead of adding an alkyl agent like alkylating agent like benzyl bromide, here we're adding in an aldehyde as our electrophile. If you also recall, um, the main reason uh, or the main method that we access these different Z and E enol ethers is using various different bases. And so in the first case, these are both kinetic enolates. We're going to favor the E enolate if we use a less substituted, less hindered base uh, to deprotonate this alpha position and then trap with TMS chloride. However, if we use a more bulky, more substituted base, such as lithium TMP, we'll end up getting the Z enolate as our intermediate, which can then be trapped by TMS. Um, however, while these ratios do favor one over the other, they're still not entirely selective. But once we start looking at boron enol, uh, enolate formation, we can get very high selectivity with greater selectivity than 99 to 1. So it's quite advantageous to use boron containing enolates. Now, first let's talk about the Mukayama aldol reaction. So if you don't want to activate and remake a lithium enolate with uh, methyl lithium or some activator such as fluoride, it's possible to use a Lewis acid to activate the aldehyde. So in this case, the TMS enol ether is able to attack the aldehyde due to the cat catalysis uh, afforded by the Lewis acid. And then upon workup, this will be converted to the beta hydroxy ketone. Now the Lewis acid can uh, pop off and go and catalyze other reactions, but the stereochemistry of this overall transformation compared to the lithium enolate chemistry, which is fairly straightforward and pr produces one predictable diastereomer, this can produce several different products depending on the conditions that you use, depending on what Lewis acid is used, and on what substrates you're working with. And so if you were to just use typical conditions such as like titanium tetrachloride, BF3 or tin tetrachloride, you'll get a big mixture of products, at least four diastereomers, plus a mixture of enantiomers. However, there are chiral Lewis acid complexes that have been used that can give you really good uh, enantioselective control, and certain conditions can give you very good diastereoselective control. So you can get predictable outcomes and high uh, enantioselectivity if you use the right conditions. But as this is an introductory organic course, we're not going to be getting into that in these sets of lectures. Um, so moving on to the boron aldol. So a boron aldol is similar to a mukayama aldol, except you don't need a Lewis acid. The boron enolate is still quite a good nucleophile, and it can react with an aldehyde. It's less reactive than a lithium enolate. Lithium enolates react in a matter of minutes at a very low temperature. Boron enolates typically react at a slightly higher temperature, within you know four to 16 hours kind of thing. Um, 
However, it's still quite a good reaction compared to the Mukayama aldol, which requires Lewis acid. The only Lewis acid in this molecule is the boron of the enolate. And we can rationalize this as a coordination effect to the aldehyde, as I'll show in the next scheme here. So here you can see that the aldehyde is able to donate some of its electron density into the boron, and the electron density on the enolate oxygen can collapse into the enolate uh, carbon double bond carbon, allowing an attack on the aldehyde. And we, when we do this reaction, we form this complex. And because this is a like cyclic complex, this is a very stable boron-containing species. And so it's necessary to do an oxidative workup to get your product out. Now, there is other chemistry you can do with these. And you can use this boron to achieve really good stereochemical control of delivery of nucleophiles to, the, to this uh, ketone. But we're going to get into that once we start talking more about reducing agents in a subsequent video. Um, so this isn't always shown in synthetic schemes, but it's necessary to do an oxidative workup to get rid of this boron-containing species. But it's under mild enough conditions that no elimination of the hydroxy occurs and no oxidation of the hydroxy occurs to the corresponding ketone. Um, in this case, because we are using a Z enolate, and if you recall, zusamen means together, so this ethyl group and this boron uh, oxygen-containing compound, they're on the same side, so this is Z. Um, because we use that, we're gonna get a syn alcohol product. Uh, because there's no chiral Lewis acid here, it's important to remember that there's going to be the other enantiomer of this, but we should only get a single diastereomer. Now, you might be wondering, how do we choose whether we get an E or a Z enolate using uh, boron-containing electrophiles? And so it turns out that if you choose your conditions, you can get really good selectivity. In this first case, we have propiophenone, and it's treated with 9-BBN chloride, and using diisopropyl ethylamine as a base, we're afforded with only essentially only one uh, diastereomer of this product, which is the Z alkene with greater than 99 to 1 selectivity. However, if we use a different boron containing uh, chloride uh, with a different base, triethylamine, we get greater than 99 to 1 selectivity for the E alkene product. If we take the same al if we take the same electrophile but it replace the chloride with a triflate and change the base from triethylamine to diisopropyl ethylamine, we can re-invert the selectivity and get greater than 99 to 1 selectivity favoring the Z alkene. And so while this ratio can change from substrate to substrate, it tends to be fairly consistent favoring the alkenes shown here. So if you use these conditions, you'll tend to favor a Z alkene. If you use these conditions, you'll tend to favor an E alkene. And if you use these conditions, you'll tend to favor a Z alkene. Um, and here are the structures of some of these on the right, just so it's like less confusing. You might think some of these look rather exotic, but this 9-BBN is very easy to prepare from commercially available materials, and even the 9-BBN chloride or bromide are commercially available, so they're, they're accessible. Now, you, as I didn't mention, but I had written on a previous slide, when you prepare these enolates, you don't form the thermodynamic boron enolates. You only can access the kinetic enolates. And so if you want to access thermodynamic boron enolates, so the alkene in the more substituted position, it's necessary to get a little bit clever. And so as we talked about with 1,4 addition of nucleophiles to Michael acceptors in a previous lecture, it's possible to use a borane, a BH compound, as a hydride nucleophile. And then the boron ends up trapping the oxygen as the boron enolate. And so in this case, we can get Z enolates with good selectivity. Um, if you wanted to do an E enolate, you'd have to get a little bit more clever. And even this chemistry is not very well uh, used, but it's it's a fairly robust mechanism. So here we have a hydride donating into the Michael acceptor in the beta position. The alpha position collapses the electron density in, forming an enolate, which is then trapped by the boron, forming the boron enolate product. And so this is a useful way to get other enantiomers or other diastereomers that are less uh, kinetically accessible using this chemistry. Um, one really cool trick you can do if you do want a TMS enolate, but you're having trouble preparing it for some reason, is you can make the boron enolate, and in this case, this was made via a conjugate addition as well, as this is a more substituted one, and then treat it with TMS imidazole. And so there's this great paper that shows you can convert um, boron enolates to TMS enolates in good conversion under really mild conditions. And so if you need to make this, this is a clever trick to have in your back pocket. It can be easier than doing the triethylamine reflux in DMF with TMS chloride that you normally do, as this affords you with a single uh, single product. So this is very useful. So with that, I'd like to assign two different practice problems. In the first problem, assign conditions that would afford you with this product and this product respectively. 
they can be different R containing groups. You just pick some sort of boronating agent, borylating agent that will afford these products under specific conditions. Additionally, given this alkene and this alkene enolates, um, treating them with benzaldehyde will afford different products. And so I'd like you to show what those products would be and maybe rationalize why the sin or the anti is favored. And so with that, I hope this has been a useful lecture on boron and silicon containing enolate aldol reactions. If you have any questions, I'd encourage you to leave them below. If you like this video, I'd appreciate it if you could give it a like and maybe share it with someone you know. Have a great day.